In this lecture, I plan to bring on to the stage uh, Alexander the Great himself uh, as the heir apparent of Philip II and his principal queen, Olympias. And this lecture requires us to look at the parents of Alexander, the uh, type of life that existed at the court of Pella, which in some ways was very Hellenic, in other ways it's very traditionally Macedonian. And then we'll also deal with the whole amb ambiguous relationship uh, that Alexander apparently had with his father, his devotion to his mother, and how both parents really shaped and motivated Alexander. Uh, both of them uh, inculcated Alexander with a sense of destiny, with a sense of position as the king of Macedon. Uh, and finally, we'll conclude with the very lurid politics that put Alexander the Great on the throne and is still the subject of controversy, whether Alexander was somehow involved in the death of his father. Well, in the last lecture, I had uh, uh, concluded with Philip of Macedon at the height of his power. In the summer of 337 BC, Philip had very good reasons to be congratulating himself. He had brought the Greek cities under his control, and he was beginning to look east towards an expedition against Persia. Early in the next year, in 336 BC, actually, Macedonian forces crossed over into Asia Minor. Uh, they crossed the Hellespont under the command of Parmenio and uh, began to prepare a bridgehead for the Macedonian invasion. Philip had every intention of leading this expedition, and his son Alexander at the time, who is probably about, oh, 20 years of age, maybe 21 years of age, we're still a little uncertain exactly when Alexander's birthday was because it was subject to a lot of legend, uh, was to accompany him. And what happened is Philip never led that expedition. He was cut down by an assassin, a man named uh, Pausanias of Orestes, who killed Philip um, reputedly uh, for personal grievance and Alexander suddenly found himself in charge of the Macedonian Kingdom, the Hellenic Alliance, and heir to the expedition against Persia. This was an unexpected turn of events, and it was to the credit of Philip that the Kingdom of Macedon did not fragment, that, his, that Philip's death did not lead to the disorder typical of previous Macedonian kings, in which the position was very personal. Uh, Philip had built the types of institutions uh, a, a committed army, a court, administrators, uh, that would ensure the continuity of the kingdom. Uh, but his greatest gift was his son, Alexander, his heir, and Philip always regarded Alexander as his really, his only, only true heir, even though Philip had uh, seven wives and a number of different children and more different extracurricular activities than one would care to enumerate. Uh, nonetheless, uh, his son proved to be one of the uh, greatest conquerors of all time, if, and, and arguably the greatest general of all time. So let us take a look at uh, Alexander and how he was prepared for this position, which he assumed at either age 20 or 21. He very much was a product of both of his parents. Uh, Philip II of Macedon and Olympias are both clearly brilliant individuals. They were also extremely passionate. Um, they both could be a bit erratic and vindictive, and one could even argue that each was a genius and at the same time a bit crazy. Philip himself had never expected to get to the throne. He was the third son of King Amyntas III, who died in 369 BC, and he was preceded by his two older brothers. And when Philip came to the throne at around age 24 or 25, he was, in effect, the backup heir. And that had a profound influence on Philip in terms of surviving the very, very rough court politics at Pella. He had had that time in Thebes as a political hostage. And so when Philip came to the throne, he was very well aware of the need to secure his dynasty. And he conducted a number of different marriages in his career. These marriages were often uh, political in nature. And as I've mentioned in passing, the Macedonian kings, the Argead family, uh, did practice polygamy. Uh, this was a state policy. This was typical of Macedonian kings. It persisted into the Hellenistic age. Members of the nobility, we suspect, may have done the same if it afforded them advance, uh, advantages. This type of marriage arrangement was not what was practiced by uh, Greeks, especially Greek aristocratics, uh, aristocratic families, where the marriage was between a man and woman of a great family. They were equals. The lower classes apparently were monogamous. Um, this polygamy characterized the Macedonian kings as kings, at least in the eyes of the Greeks. 
As I said, the marriages were dynastic, and he came to the throne. Philip quickly concluded several marriages. Uh, one was to a leading aristocratic woman of Macedon. It cemented relations with the great families of Western Macedon. Her name was Phila. Uh, another one was an Illyrian princess, Audata, who was actually a relative of Bardilius, who was the uh, political opponent of Philip, the Illyrian king who had killed his brother. Uh, in the course of his interventions in Thessaly, he acquired two different Thessalian wives, both of them from leading aristocratic families. By the first of these, Philina, he had a son called Aridaeus, the later Philip Aridaeus, a half-brother of Alexander the Great. Uh, by the second uh, Thessalian wife, he had a daughter named Thessalonike, uh, which means essentially victory of Thessaly. Uh, there was another Agitic princess, that is a woman from Thrace. Uh, her name is um, rendered in Greek as Medea. We're not sure exactly what her name was in, a, in Illyrian or Gitic. Uh, but without a doubt, the principal wife, uh, and, and these five wives I've mentioned were all political marriages. There were some children from it. But his principal wife was a woman named Olympias. Now, Philip and Olympias met probably in 357 B.C. at the great mysteries held on the island of Samothrace in the northern Aegean. Uh, these were ancient mysteries dedicated to the great gods. Uh, we know that Olympias herself uh, was a devotee of Dionysus. Uh, Dionysus, the god of wine and enthusiasm, and according to Plutarch and some of the anecdotes he reports, uh, she was really good at getting involved in these Bacchic uh, dances. Uh, she had a really wild nature, and uh, she kept tame snakes that, you know, tended to frighten the spectators, and um, that was just part of the cult. She was the daughter of King Neoptolemus of Epirus. Epirus is essentially northwest Greece. Uh, the Epirotes were a Greek people who had never coalesced into city-states and were looked upon by their Greek cousins as really a bit retarded politically. I mean, they looked like something out of Homer. Uh, but Neoptolemus, and it's the same name of the son of um, Achilles, uh, who avenged his father uh, Achilles in the later accounts after the Iliad, uh, Neoptolemus absolutely uh, was Greek by lineage. There was no doubt Olympias was a direct descendant of Achilles, and she never let Philip uh, forget it, and she always reminded her son Alexander. Uh, she was clearly regarded as a queen of great bearing. She was a Greek speaker. She was of Greek ancestry. She was not a Thessalian or Macedonian aristocrat. She was not a barbarian princess. She was the real queen. And her two children, Alexander, born in 356, and then about a year later, his sister Cleopatra, both of them were clearly the principal line of the Argead house. And Philip never had any doubt that Alexander was his true heir. Uh, Aridaeus, the only other legitimate son of Philip, had been born about a year earlier, and he turns out to apparently be some kind of half-wit. Uh, the story put out is that Olympias actually fed Aridaeus uh, poisoned mushrooms, so he never developed mentally. Uh, we don't think that story is true, but it ought to be, and certainly Olympias would like us to believe it. She always protected the interests of her son against any potential rival. There were other potential heirs to the Macedonian throne, but not among the children of Philip. These were other collateral lines we'll get to. Uh, Olympias and Philip, when they met, it was a tempestuous love match by all accounts. Uh, the two of them were taken with each other. They were married in less than a year. It was an important political alliance, but it also, uh, at least in its initial stage, was a love match, and then they fell out of love and became quite vindictive to each other. Uh, the only comparable marriage I can come up with, uh, and at this point Philip is in his late 20s and Olympias is probably towards her mid-20s, uh, would probably be Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine. It really was uh, the marriage of the 4th century B.C. Uh, the, uh, the relationship between Philip and Olympias cooled very early on. Uh, now, Philip was no novice to various uh, sexual exploits, uh, but Olympias keeping pet snakes in the bed, that, that caused Philip's ardor to cool, according to Plutarch. Uh, there were other reasons why uh, they clashed. Olympias didn't tolerate well Philip's extracurricular activities, and not, not the political marriages, but all sorts of other, apparently, activities that that Philip conducted outside the marriage. Uh, there was the all-night uh, all drinking parties with the nobility. Uh, but above all, Olympias understood that her position at court would improve when her son would come to the throne in his own right. Uh, as in many Mediterranean societies, in this regard the Macedonians are very Mediterranean, uh, a queen mother always has a far greater power over her son than she does over her husband, particularly if that husband is such a dramatic and um, 
uh, able figure with very great ambitions of his own and with other wives and other potential heirs. So from the start, uh, uh, Olympias became increasingly disenchanted with her husband. Uh, she became in time disdainful and even vindictive in a number of ways, and there were repeated clashes. Ugly clashes that Alexander must have experienced early in his life up until age 13, where, when he was reared at court. Nonetheless, uh, Olympias uh, was very, very important in forming Alexander for several reasons. She certainly was, up until age 12 or 13, in charge of Alexander's uh, education. She picked the tutors, and this was a traditional role that Macedonian queens performed. Uh, we know of the earliest tutor, a fellow named uh, uh, Leonidas or Leonidas, uh, the same name as the famous uh, Spartan king who fell at Thermopylae. Uh, he was a taskmaster in many ways and imposed a very, very strict diet and exercise regimen on Alexander and also uh, constantly lectured Alexander about being frugal. Uh, there's an incident reported in Plutarch that this tutor uh, really chided Alexander for putting too much incense on the altar. Uh, which was a burnt offering to the gods. He, he reminded Alexander that he really didn't have the money to do this. Macedon was a relatively small and poor kingdom. And later in life, when Alexander you know, conquered the world and got all of this incense you know, captured from the Persians, he sent a huge consignment back to that tutor to remind him, well, uh, now I can do it. You know, I, I've done my job. I've conquered the world. And here, have some incense on me. Um, it's a marvelous anecdote, which is uh, typical of the types of stories that were associated with Alexander. Uh, Leonidas, or Leonidas, was, however, Olympias's choice. She had a profound influence on Alexander also because Philip was so often campaigning. He was a restless king. He was always fighting on the northern borders, engaged in diplomacy with the Greeks. And Alexander grew up devoted to his mother. Uh, there is no, no, no doubt from the sources that she was his confidant in many ways. Uh, he apparently read, uh, wrote repeated letters to her in Macedon. He had no illusions about her ambitions politically, but he was devoted to her, and he really paid attention to the various stories that Olympias put out later on, uh, apparently according to some sources in Plutarch, that Alexander was told by Olympias, uh, by the way, dear, um, you know, it wasn't Philip who impregnated me, it was that serpent who was really Zeus who came to me. Uh, and then there are other stories that it was the ex-pharaoh of Egypt and everything. But somehow in these disputes between, uh, between Olympias and Philip as Alexander was growing up, this notion that Alexander had some kind of divine parentage, he was linked to Zeus, this, this came out in the really complicated mind games played between Olympias and Philip uh, over who would control that son. Nonetheless, uh, uh, Philip himself uh, was an absolutely devoted father and really gave the best education he could uh, to his son. Uh, by age 13, as F Alexander was coming of age, he took, her, he took him out of the charge of Olympias and entrusted him to a man who was uh, recommended to him for various contacts in the Greek world, a fellow named Aristotle, who turns out to be the great philosopher. Uh, Aristotle spent three years with Alexander at a Macedonian retreat known as Mitza. It's essentially a summer retreat from the court at Pella, where Alexander and a group of boyhood friends, many of them coming from the leading families of Macedon, they were the sons very often of the great noble families of Western Macedon or other important families. Uh, these included men such as Ptolemy, the future king of Egypt, Hyphestion, the closest of Alexander's friends, uh, Leonidas, who saves Alexander's life in India. And all of these men later became bodyguards to Alexander. They end up becoming major generals, and some of them become kings after Alexander. They were all reared together and trained by Aristotle, and it must have been a remarkably powerful intellectual experience, a really heady experience to grow up with such extraordinary people as your playmates uh, and being taught by a man who turned out to be uh, the greatest successor to Plato's philosophical system and uh, one of the great thinkers uh, in the Western tradition. Um, Furthermore, there are anecdotes that are told about Alexander with two notions in mind. One was to stress uh, the devotion of the father to the son. Others were to show the precocious nature of Alexander, which Philip recognized. And despite um, the sort of ambivalent feelings uh, uh, Alexander might have had, uh, Philip never had a doubt that his son was extraordinary and would succeed to him. I take two of those anecdotes out of Plutarch, and really Plutarch's Life of Alexander is a marvelous 
uh, reservoir of different types of, of stories that came down through different traditions. And I started this course stressing the fact that Plutarch, as a biographer, was interested in the character and the personality of Alexander rather than the great deeds. And we really owe it to him that Alexander, and to some extent Philip and Olympias, come alive as individuals because of that biography. Well, one of the most impressive anecdotes that comes down to us is the anecdote associated with uh, Alexander taming the horse Bucephalus. This is a favorite theme in Western art and literature. Alexander was an adolescent at the time. Uh, Philip had paid an enormous sum for this charger, this horse Bucephalus that had distinct markings, and no one could break the horse. The horse was unrideable. On the other hand, Alexander, observing the efforts of various trainers to ride that horse, understood that the horse was essentially skittish and afraid of its own shadow. And he then offered himself uh, uh, as the man to break the horse. Everyone was concerned. He was, after all, crown prince. He was really the only son to follow Philip. The half-wit didn't count. And nonetheless, Philip allowed it to be done. Alexander turned the horse away from uh, the sun and positioned the horse so he could not see its shadow. He mounted the horse, immediately leaped on it, which is quite a feat because they don't have stirrups in the ancient world, and broke the horse immediately and rode him. Uh, Bucephalus becomes the charger of Alexander in his battles in Asia, and when the horse dies in India shortly after the Battle of Hy uh, Hydaspes, he builds a city in honor of the horse Bucephala. Philip was overjoyed. That is, he, it showed his son's uh, brilliance as well as his courage his resourcefulness, and, uh, and Philip's comment apparently after this is, my son, uh, when you grow up, you will have to find greater kingdoms because Macedon will not hold you. Uh, Philip already saw in his son that genius uh, that would lead him to conquer the Persian Empire and affect the ancient world. Uh, there are several other stories, I think, that are telling, and it's worth uh, bringing in. Uh, there is a story associated, apparently, in, when Alexander was about the same age, somewhere between 12 and 15, that reports came in of one of Philip's great victories. Uh, Alexander's response to the news was, if Philip, and he referred to him as Philip, not my father, uh, if Philip continues to win these victories, there'll be nothing left for me. Uh, this certainly shows the sort of attitude that Olympias would approve of. And, and uh, there is a, a, seri a series of incidents and anecdotes that come down to us to sus that lead us to suspect that from age 15 on, when Alexander was taken out of the charge of Aristotle and, and introduced, in effect, into public life, uh, that Alexander was always very uneasy that he might be replaced as the crown prince. And undoubtedly, Olympias fed these notions all the time. Uh, Alexander uh, was such a remarkable figure that later generations, uh, or maybe within even Alexander's own generation, uh, created all sorts of omens and portents that Alexander was destined to greatness. The favorite one I always like to talk about is either on July 20th or July 21st, 356 BC, the year of Alexander's birth, uh, that a fellow named Herostratus, who's essentially the first pyromaniac known in history, burned down the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, the great Artemisium, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the, uh, when he was questioned by the city father, fathers, why did you do it? He said, well, because it's there and I like to see things burn. So I think we can, uh, we can judge the personal motive there. On the other hand, the story was put out. The reason why the fire took place is because Artemis was away in Pella, uh, making sure that Alexander uh, would be born. And Alexander liked that kind of story. It's the sort of story Olympias might have approved of. Uh, and there are other stories that at the time of the birth, uh, Philip gained three important messages. One, the birth of his son, the most important, a victory by his general Parmenio, and his, tor his horse took first place in the Olympic Games. So these stories are all associated with the birth. They're um, augmented and elaborated by uh, later accounts. Uh, at age 15, when Alexander uh, uh, was coming of age, there are again two other incidents that are reported uh, that show his precociousness. One was a series of Persian envoys who arrived. And the suspicion is these fellows are negotiating with Philip at this point, somewhere around 341, 342 BC, uh, because they're afraid that Philip has designs on the Persian Empire and he has received Persian exiles at court. Philip was not available. Only Alexander, with his regent Antipater, the senior general that essentially took Philip's place was out while, uh, uh, while Philip was on campaign. 
And according to the accounts, uh, and one wonders what the official report was back at Sousa, um, I, I would always reconstruct it this way. These per Persian envoys came into the court of Pella and were met by this 14 or 15 year old boy. Uh, and the immediate reaction to him was, where's Kil King Philip? And he said, well, he's not, my father isn't here, but uh, let me ask you some questions. And they were absolutely amazed at, the, at Alexander's knowledge of the size of the Persian Empire, the roads and everything. Uh, little did they know that five years later he would be ro overrunning their empire. Um, and it's always a marvelous story, you know, prefiguring um, of the greatness which was to come. The other uh, uh, side of that uh, aspect of Alexander uh, inquiring the Persia, uh, with the Persian um, envoys is shortly afterwards, uh, on his own, probably at age 15, he commanded a Macedonian army, defeated a uh, Balkan tribe known as the Madai, and founded a city named Alexandropolis, city of Alexander. That's the sort of thing kings should do. So by the time Alexander is fighting at the Battle of Kairane at age 18, he had been groomed for this position of king of Macedon. And whether these anecdotes are elaborated, augmented, true, invented, they all point to a remarkable side of this uh, young prince. He was, without a doubt, precocious to his own generation and to later generations as well. This gets us into the question of what inspired and motivated Alexander the Great. He saw himself as the descendant of Heracles uh, on his father's side, that is the Roman Hercules, and Achilles on his mother's side. Both were great heroes, perhaps the greatest figures recognized in the Greek world, in the case of Heracles, he eventually was elevated to join the gods at his death. There's an apotheosis, a point we'll come back to. Uh, unlike his father, Philip, he did not have much exposure to Greek political notions. Uh, despite the education of Aristotle, he never accepted Aristotle's distinction of Hellenes versus barbarians, as we shall see when Alexander's in Asia and when it is politically opportune and, and appropriate. He will marry uh, Persian, or at least Iranian women of high rank, uh, as his queens, uh, because that's what Macedonian kings do. They have to marry the aristocracy of noble defeated foes, something no Greek would ever consider. And he saw his Persian subjects, once he had conquered Persia, uh, especially the aristocrats, as worthy members at court, people that he must pay attention to and ennoble and make use of. Again, he had not bought the Greek political notions that Greeks are unique because they live in a polis and they are distinct from barbarians. In other ways, he was a completely a Greek aristocrat. He carried his own version of Homer around, annotated. He had personal reasons for that. It was annotated by Aristotle. Uh, he saw himself as a Greek in his language. He spoke Attic Greek usually. He did know Macedonian. Uh, in his aesthetics, in his uh, uh, choice of literature, he was thoroughly a Greek aristocrat. He undoubtedly knew his Homer well. He had read uh, widely. And um, above all, uh, he encouraged his depiction by various artists, notably the artist Lysippus. And Lysippus apparently really captured the portrait of Alexander very well. There are some who would argue that the great mosaic in the archaeological museum at Naples, found in Pompeii, is based on an original painting that goes back to Lysippus. It depicts Alexander, who was not particularly tall in height and had light brownish hair and a ruddy complexion, but was powerfully built, absolutely heroic and brave. And if anyone has ever seen that mosaic, it's really a stunning piece. And it is probably our best representation of what Alexander looked like. We do have statue heads, coin types, and other things. But that seems to go back to an original. Uh, from the start, therefore, Alexander was devoted to the heroes of Greece, the heroes of his ancestors. And what really motivates him in his career uh, to carry out the great conquest is not a pan-Hellenic war, uh, not even imperialism to expand the Macedonian monarchy or the types of uh, uh, motives that would be assigned in a modern nation state. Uh, and and, and it's, it's what Arian and Plutarch speak of uh, repeatedly, a pothos, a longing, a yearning, a desire to emulate his ancestors and to exceed them. And Alexander throughout his career is constantly attempting to approach uh, Achilles and Heracles. Later on in Central Asia, he takes Dionysus as another uh, uh, example. There's a reason for that we'll get to. But as one goes through the expedition, there are certain instances where Alex is directly imitating 
Homer, or at least Achilles. Uh, for instance, at uh, Ilium, that is the site of ancient Troy, he picks up what apparently is a tourist item, which is the shield of Athena, which he carries through Asia. He propitiates the spirits of King Priam and the Trojan royal family because they had been killed, they had been defeated uh, by his ancestor, Neoptolemus, the son of Achilles. Um, uh, when he captures the city of Gaza, the Persian governor general there, a fellow named Batis, is actually, uh, the body is strapped to a chariot and dragged around the city in imitation of uh, Achilles' treatment of the body of, of Hector in the Iliad. And so we have some of these uh, direct imitations. But it went much deeper than that. It was the driving force uh, behind uh, all of Alexander's actions. It was also the driving force that led Alexander to conclude by his lifetime that by his great and glorious deeds, he would enter the company of the gods. And that, of course, would run him into trouble with both his Macedonians and then, above all, with his Greek allies. Well, this young prince, who by age 18 was clearly marked as the heir apparent to Philip of Macedon, um, had ambivalent feelings towards his father, and this is brought out by two incidents that fed into the assassination of Philip and eventually uh, the succession of Alexander. Uh, at one point, as Philip was preparing for his expedition to Persia, uh, there was an arrangement with one of the Carian dynasts, a fellow named Pixodaurus, a brother of Mausolus, and Philip offered Aridaeus to a daughter of Pixodaurus as a political marriage. Alexander's friends heard of this, reported it to Alex. Alex immediately took this as a slight. What is his father doing? He's marrying him, his, his half-brother off, the half-wit. Alexander was not yet married. Was Philip going to put him aside? And so Alexander, in his own initiative, sent invitation to the Carian dynasts and offered himself uh, as uh, uh, the uh, groom to this Carian princess. Well, Philip was enraged, put Alexander, took Alexander aside, said, look, this is a minor small town dynast. Marrying Aridaeus uh, is just a political move. This doesn't count. I'm saving you for greater things. And by the way, some of your friends are going to be exiled because they gave you bad advice. Alexander was fuming over this because uh, he, he took it as a slight. And it goes to show how sensitive he was about it. Uh, in 337 BC, is our best guess, uh, Philip had finally had it with Olympias. Uh, he's getting ready for his uh, expedition in Asia. He settled all of the affairs in Greece, and he repudiated Olympias. We don't know if there was a formal divorce, but Olympias went home to Epirus, and she was at the court of her brother, a uh, fellow also known as Alexander, Alexander of Epirus. Alexander the Great was very upset about this, and furthermore, Philip took a seventh and last wife, and this wife was named Cleopatra, sometimes Cleopatra Eurydice. She was a high noble Macedonian lady. Her uncle was Attalus, one of the leading generals in the Macedonian army, uh, who was a uh, protege and friend of Parmenio. And the marriage clearly was an intention to set up an alternate line uh, to the royal house. Uh, Philip was practical. Uh, he was about 47 at the time. Uh, Cleopatra was in her mid-20s. They would have children. There would be alternate heirs in the event that Alex and Phil got killed in Asia. Well, Alexander, devoted, he was upset by the whole thing. And at the marriage um, celebrations, uh, where there was the usual heavy drinking, uh, Attalus got up and toasted Philip and said, uh, uh, to the health of the king and his wife and to their legitimate children. Alexander, at the other end of the table, who was spoiling for a fight all day, uh, got up and said, then, sir, I believe you regard me as a bastard. Philip was enraged. Uh, that Alexander had challenged uh, Attalus. He got up, he called for a spear, he was quite drunk, and he stumbled because Philip had suffered a very severe wound in one of his legs, and he was a bit lame. He fell on the, on the floor, and Alexander, in contempt, said, here, Macedonians, is the man who will lead you to Asia, and yet he cannot get from one end of the table to the next. Well, Alexander's friends did him a great service and got him out of the hall, and he went into exile for a while, and it took some months before Alexander was uh, reconciled. Uh, there was a big reconciliation at a GI, uh, Vergina, where the great tombs have been found. And uh, this occurred apparently uh, late summer, early of autumn of 336 BC. Philip was marching to the theater with Alex on one side and Alexander of Epirus on the other, that is Olympias's brother. And a man came through the crowd, Pausanias of Orestes, put a dagger in Phil and ran. He was cut down, no questions were asked. There have been numerous accounts 
and a lot more speculation on what motivated this assassin. Some have attributed it to Olympias, other to the Persians, some would say Demosthenes, but many suspect, some scholars suspect, Alexander had a hand in it to get rid of his father. Uh, uh, an author such as Tarn would say, no, that is not the way Alexander acted. Modern scholars who have a diabolical Alexander said, well, of course he did. This is typical. This is what goes on. Uh, the case is really nolo contendere, and I doubt that Alexander really had anything in it uh, involved in this conspiracy. Uh, Pausanias of Orestes was apparently a lone assassin. He had suffered a humiliation uh, at the hands of Attalus. Actually, Attalus was angry. Um, that is the uh, uncle of Philip's last wife, and actually turned um, uh, uh, Pausanias, the assassin, over to the stable boys who had their way with them, and, and Philip would not restore Pausanias' honor, and, and this is the sort of stuff that went on at Pella all the time, and Pausanias decided to go at him with the dagger. In any event, uh, it was unexpected. Alexander suddenly found himself as king. Olympias was delighted. Uh, Cleopatra Eurydice, of course, disappears with her children. And there were the executions of a few individuals who were possible heirs to Phil, but no grand reprisals. In fact, the event came very unexpectedly and put Alexander in some ways in jeopardy. The Greeks cheered. As soon as the news came back of Philip's death, the monster is dead. Demosthenes held um, sacrifices to Zeus for this and to freedom. Little did they know that Philip left not only a great kingdom, but an even greater heir. And Alexander, within 18 months, would secure that legacy and be marching off to Asia.